Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Eric Flesch, the director of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums, and welcome to this sixth of seven presentations as part of the 2021 Winter Lyceum. Today is the 21st day of March 2021, and I'm broadcasting from Wisconsin's hilly Driftless area from the city of Platteville, home of the world's largest letter M on beautiful Platte Mound in the heart of the upper Mississippi Valley lead and zinc mining region where the Badger State was born. Uh, today is the second day of spring, and so with that, we're getting excited about the annual reopening for tour season. The museums will be open to visitors daily this year, May 1st through October 31st, at our beautiful three-acre museum campus, and we look forward to resuming not only general museum admission to all exhibition galleries, but also guided mine tours and train rides. This is a special year for our museums, founded in 1965 by the city of Platteville. 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of the completion of the Mining Museum, the 45th anniversary of the opening of the Bevins Lead Mine in the museum's backyard, and the 40th anniversary of the opening of the Rollo Jamison Museum. So we have many special programs and initiatives in store for this special year that integrate the two distinct aspects of our museum's identity the humanities aspect of history and culture, and the STEAM aspect of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Our holistic place-based approach celebrates human ingenuity, inquiry, enterprise, and development, what might be called the pioneering spirit in the context of our region over a long timeline. I invite you to stay up to date on these and many more programs designed to inspire optimism in our community and to connect Platteville's past to its bright future. You can make your reservations and donations online at www.mining.jameson.museum. I'd like to thank all of you who have registered to participate live today. I extend a warm welcome to current friends of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum's members and donors. And I'd like to thank the sponsors whose financial support has made this program possible. Taco John's H&R Block, A&W Restaurant of Platteville, Inspiring Community, and Southwest Health. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to enjoy a presentation by Mike Mayer, titled Kaiten, Japan's World War II Human Torpedo That Stunned the U.S. Navy. Last week, we learned about Native American peoples who carved a living out of changing driftless area landscapes over 13,000 years of history, leaving records of their material culture in the lithic projectile tools and other artifacts found in the archaeological sites of our region. Today, we're shifting gears to a more recent period of history in which Wisconsiners traveled together with Americans from many other places in support of the United States government to defend our values and interests in foreign landscapes. In the 20th century, the economies of towns in the upper Mississippi Valley Mining District boomed in every period of war from World War I through the Cold War conflicts as armies clamored for lead, for projectiles, zinc for brass ammunition casings, and sulfuric acid for explosives. In these wars, the southern driftless area contributed the best of its natural resources to serve not only the fruits of its Mississippi Valley type ore deposits, rich in strategic minerals, but also its people. And these Wisconsin men and also their families back home would be changed forever by the experiences of their service. And now, before we begin our program with Mike Mayer, I'd like to invite you to participate in a question and answer session at the end of this evening's presentation. Because we are a group of well over 110 people and we're doing this via Zoom, in the interest of time, I invite you to type out your questions as they come to mind and to submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen during the talk. And at the end, Mike Mayer will answer as many of the questions as he is able. I'm now pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, a businessman as well as a historian. Michael Mayer is the son of a USS Mississinua survivor. He began research for his book in 1995, including extensive interviews with other survivors, former IJN officers, 
and naval personnel stationed in the Pacific at this crucial time in 1944. He has appeared in various History Channel programs, served as a consultant for the Canadian television program Sea Hunters, and contributed to Naval History Magazine. He lives in Platteville, Wisconsin. It's my great honor to welcome Mike Mayer. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this evening with uh, all of you, and thank you for joining us. Well, what you just saw is the cover of the book Kaiten, and the meaning of the word Kaiten is an English interpretation of the Japanese word, and Kaiten means changing of the heavens or to make a great sky change. We're going to talk today about a secret weapon that few people in the United States and around the world know about. And so this particular slide explains my father, John Jack Mayer, was a survivor of the USS Mississinewa, sunk by this secret weapon, a human guided torpedo in November 1944. So the pictures you see here is myself on the left and then on the right uh, out at Ulithi Atoll, about a mile and a half from where the Mississinewa sank. And so moving right along here, as I was growing up in the 1950s, 1960s, my father never talked about his service in World War II and Korea. And of course, as a youngster, I was always very interested, always very interested in ships in the Navy. The picture on the left uh, shows me with uh, the battleship uh, there, actually the battleship Missouri, a model that I received for Christmas. Of course, I had to call it the USS Wisconsin, needless to say. The book on the right, really catapulted me as a boy into, into this story. I found this little tiny paperback book at a local grocery store a couple blocks from my home. And this particular paperback was actually written by a, an army journalist that was in Japan during the occupation, Joseph Harrington. And he listened to the story of uh, Yotoka Ikata, who was also part of the kamikaze submarine not the best term to be using we'll talk about that a little bit later and i purchased this book and pedaled my bicycle home my father came home from work from parker pen company i was so excited and like most boys 11 12 years old i'm waving the book in front of him i said dad dad your ship is mentioned on the back cover of this book tell me what happened tell me what happened and i remember my father seated in his easy chair reading the evening newspaper he took a look at the book he looked at the back cover and then he threw it across the living room where it landed on the couch and he didn't say another word for 29 long years i was certainly quite disappointed well my father was 19 when he went into the the service from World War II and took his basic training at Great Lakes Naval Center, January 1944. And there's a picture of him uh, when the World War II Memorial was dedicated in 2004 in Washington, D.C. And so we'll be talking a little bit about his naval service and his experiences. I put on two reunions for the Mississippi survivors. The first one in Corpus Christi, Texas in 1999. And the men that you see pictured there were um, the men that attended this particular reunion. Uh, my father, John Mayer is right here holding on to the corner of the banner. Would you believe that not a single one of these survivors in 1999 had any idea how the USS Mississippi had been sunk despite decades that had gone by. Pretty remarkable. It wasn't until they got to the reunion and I revealed to them video footage and a tremendous amount of research, including research from Japan that showed them what happened. 
The ship left Norfolk, Virginia in June of 1944. The Mississippi was an oiler, and oiler is a naval term for a tanker, a ship that carries fuel. And a ship that carries a fuel that is very, very large to be able to fuel the fleet at sea. They went to Aruba and picked up an entire load of oil. They went through the Panama Canal that sailors called the ditch. And then they moved on to Pearl Harbor. And this picture was taken at Pearl Harbor. That red arrow that you see on the screen is my father, John Mayer, uh, hiding in the very back row. He worked in the engine room. And so he was what they called a fireman second class. I began research for my first book, Oil, Fire, and Fate, in 1995. The first step was really to get my dad to try and uh, talk a little bit about his experiences. The ice was broken in 1995 when my son, BJ, at that time was in sixth grade at Platteville School District, and he had an assignment to write something about a grandparent. On the way to visit grandpa on Labor Day, 1995, my son told me that he was going to ask Grandpa about his ship that had been sunk. Oh my goodness, my heart just sank. 29 years earlier, I was rejected when I asked the same thing, and I really was afraid that my son was going to go through the same type of experience. Well, needless to say that when BJ asked Grandpa that question moments after we arrived at Grandpa's home, Grandpa Mayor was quite taken back by that question. And he said, BJ, I don't know if students should be studying about war in school it, because war is devastation, destruction, loss of life, and terrible things. And I asked my father, why do you feel that way? He gave me a look that bored right through me. And he said, because I lived through it. I asked him if I could do some research and find out what I could about the Mississippi. And he said, Mike, go ahead and do whatever you want, but I've tried to put this behind me. It was a really tragic day. That started my quest. And the first thing was to get into the National Archives and to be able to declassify documents that were still all classified over 50 years later. With that done, I began to jog my father's memory and then. The story began to evolve from there. I connected with a translator that you're going to meet a little bit later in the session in Japan, and off we went. The book Oil, Fire, and Faith that you can read by checking it out at the Platteville Public Library was nearly 900 pages long, far more than what most people would typically read uh, for a book. However, they're, it was self-published. I paid for that myself. And there's about 400 copies that are floating around out there around the U.S. My writing mentor was James P.L. Delgado. He's pictured here on the left. Uh, he currently is the uh, Senior Technical Advisor for Drain the Oceans t television program on National Geographic. Uh, we speak on the phone frequently. He was also the former director of NOAA under the Obama administration. He, other than Robert Ballard, he's probably the best known underwater marine archaeologist uh, that we have in this country. David Sears is a famous naval author. He's written a plethora of books. And both of these men encouraged me to downsize Oil, Fire, and Fate and tell the story about Kai Ten and Mrs. Sinawa in a casual reader format. Well, I certainly needed help to do that. Jim Delgado suggested that I bring along copy editor Joy Waldron. Now, Joy is an investigative journalist, and she also is a phenomenal naval copy editor. She really knows how to write about naval subjects. And uh, I tease her all the time. I call her the wordsmith because she did a phenomenal job taking my research and working with me so that we could downsize it into the book that became Kai Ten, as you can see there in, in the photograph. So Kai Ten was published in 2014 in hardcover and 2015 in paperback. And as we will learn later, it was also published in Japan. 
The Mrs. Cinema, as I mentioned, was a naval oiler, and it was a huge ship. It was 553 feet long, nearly two football fields in length, and the ship was quite wide, about length to length. Uh, if you ran from one basketball hoop to, hoop to another on a basketball court, that'd be the width of the ship, about 75 feet. And the part of the ship you could not see below the water line was the equivalent of a three-story building. And there were guns everywhere on this oiler. This floating gas station that would fuel other ships at sea while moving through the water, well, while underway. A relatively new concept in World War II that had not been well developed yet, but it was one of the keys of the logistical effort in the Pacific that enabled the uh, combat vessels of the U.S. Navy to fight their way to Japan. As we saw earlier, the crew stopped at Pearl Harbor with their new ship, placed in commission in May of 1944. By July, they were at Pearl Harbor there for a couple days, and then off they went to the Pacific. Feeling at sea, a really difficult job. The basic concept is that, as you can see here, uh, hoses and lines are run over to another ship. In this case, it's a small escort carrier. And fuel would run through these lines to the ship that was being refueled. And they would be alongside for quite some length of time. Talk about a wet and dirty job. If you take a look at the sea splashing up in between the vessels, there was only about 75 to 100 feet between the two ships. They're moving at 10 knots and they're going that fast so that an enemy submarine would not be able to send a torpedo their way. And it was difficult work from sunup until sundown. These young boys, these young sailors were at the winches and doing all the work necessary to send fuel from Mississinawa to another vessel. Most of the time they would have a ship on each side. Mississippi would have smaller vessels on the starboard side, destroyer escorts, destroyers, and battleships and aircraft carriers, heavy cruisers would be on the port side or the left side of the vessel. It was also dangerous work, uh, very dangerous work. And this is the reason why in heavy seas, the water would come over the well deck because an oiler sat really low in the water. And so the sailors would tie themselves off with a safety line, around, put it around their waist. You can actually see one right here. And so when they got knocked off their feet, when a wave came over the deck, they wouldn't be swept overboard. Can you possibly imagine, you know, I met World War II, Oiler sailors that did this work for up to three years in the Pacific, nearly every day. I just can't begin to imagine that. And most of them were boys. The deckhands, many of them had left high school, received permission from their parents as a minor at 17 to go into the Navy. So they were all very, very young fellas, just like many of the young people in the military today. This is a picture of a Kai-10. This was a lengthened torpedo. This torpedo was called a Type 1. The Kai-10 was 48 feet long, three feet in diameter, and it had an explosive warhead that had a ton and a half of explosive. Now I'd like to point out that a conventional torpedo at that time by navies of the world would have five or 600 pounds of explosive. And it took, typically took several torpedoes to sink a ship. The Kai-10 was so powerful that the Japanese felt that with a human being in the midship's cabin with a little stubby periscope, as you can see here on the diagram, you can see the little hand crank periscope, they would be carried to a target area on the back of a large fleet mother submarine and then launched. It was a one-way trip. There was no turning back around. But the Japanese felt that the Kai-10, with one strike, could sink a major 
aircraft carrier, or a battleship. The power of this weapon was so uh, impressive. These men are referred to, whoops, these men are referred to as Kaiten pilots. And the reason why they were called pilots, the men up the top there staying on those Kaiten torpedoes, was because of the fact that they came from naval aviation programs. The Kaiten pilots were very, very different from kamikaze. Many of the kamikaze pilots could not even land their airplane. They could take the airplane off. They had rudimentary training. The Kaiten pilots, volunteers from naval aviation programs that volunteered to take this secret weapon into combat were actually highly intelligent, uh, very devoted to the mission. And most of them were actually graduates of Etajima, the Naval Academy in Japan. They were the very best of the best. They were the cream of the crop of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Toshihira Kanada was the president of an organization called Kaiten Kai. I worked very closely with Mr. Kanada for many, many years uh, for the research for this. And the going at first was difficult. The veterans from the Imperial Japanese Navy did not trust Americans or writers from the West. They felt they were biased. They felt their story would not be told with any degree of truth or accuracy. So gaining their trust was something that was a major, major challenge. We for forged a very, very close relationship. I knew that that trust had been established when I came home one day. And I found a box from Japan in my garage. In that box were actually original photographs from the Kaiten Memorial Museum in Japan, sent by Mr. Kanada with a note in there that said, Mike, you are the first American we have trusted with our story since the war. Please scan the photographs, uh, ask me any questions you'd like, and then return the photographs as soon as you can. I knew then that I had earned the trust of the Japanese. And much of that was done by actually doing research for the Imperial Japanese Navy Kaiten pilots to learn what had happened to friends of theirs that had been lost in combat. And I was able to find much of that information, including private photographs that I found that I sent to Japan. And so this mutual helping each other became uh, very much part of what I was doing. Lieutenant Minoru Yamada was just an absolutely amazing man. He was a navigator aboard a large fleet submarine, I-53. Mr. Yamada and I actually spent two years working together to try and figure out what happened on the inaugural mission, the very first mission for Kaiten, named Kikasui, that went to Ulithi Atoll, in the Western Carolina Islands where Admiral Halsey's third fleet was and sank USS Mississinawa. It was quite a mystery to unravel and it took us almost two years, but we finally managed to unravel the story and be able to figure out what actually happened. What was the truth? Now, Ulithi Atoll is located about 350 miles uh, southeast of Guam. Um, the natives that live there, Ulithians, are a sustenance culture. They don't have any industry. Um, they don't have any jobs per se. The whole purpose of the community is to help with food gathering, fishing, and so on. So it's referred to as a sustenance culture. However, their ring of islands, their atoll, of which four of the islands are inhabited, has one of the largest natural lagoons in the world. And right here, this yellow arrow shows the entrance called Mogai Channel. And that entrance led into a shallow water lagoon, lagoon that was an average depth of 140 feet. The U.S. fleet could go into the lagoon, drop anchor, and this lagoon was so large that it could fit hundreds of ships. The joke by U.S. veterans was you could walk from one end of the lagoon to the other and never get your feet wet because there were so many ships. And you can see by this photograph 
that certainly is true. And this is where my father ship, the Mississippi, was in November 1944. From this base, this large lagoon, this staging area is where they staged the invasions of the Philippines and Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And if the atomic bombs had not been dropped, Japan would have been invaded from this location. This is where everybody went through Ulithi. I've talked to hundreds of sailors that have been there. On the left here is a map of the, a harbor chart. Each one of these circles represents a ship that could anchor in that middle of that circle. Now remember a ship had to be able to swing 360 degrees on its anchor chain because of the tides. And so you could fit many, many ships uh, inside of here. This is a uh, Mogai channel, the entrance into Ulithi. And right about where my pointer is right here is where the Mississippi was sunk. And on the right, you can see pictures of uh, carrier steaming into Ulithi in October of 1944. Uh, the second picture is a very, very famous World War II photograph taken at Ulithi. These are the large Essex class aircraft carriers. And this photograph was dubbed by photojournalists as Murderer's Row. On the bottom here, these are pictures of airplanes lined up on the CB built airstrip on Falalop Island. That airstrip is still there today. That's how I landed and got there and flew out to come back home. The Kaitan pilots had their weapons mounted on the decks of a large mother submarine, as you can see in the photo in the, in the lower right hand corner there. They were strapped to the deck by bands here. And so they could, those bands could be released from inside the, the submarine, um, a couple of them anyway. That first, before they reached the target area, they would release a couple of the bands. The final bands would be released. Some of the Kaiten you could enter into from inside the mother submarine. Other earlier versions of the Type 1 Kaiten, you had to sur surface the mother submarine. The pilots climbed up in the deck, got into their weapons, the hatch was sealed and your one-way trip was about to commence when you were released. So these fleet submarines could carry four of these weapons to a target area. Aboard USS Mississinawa, this is actually Mississinawa on the right hand side here, and a fleet oiler is a busy place. Hoses everywhere as you can see hanging from the booms. And this is called the cargo deck, which had lube oil drums on it and other types of cargo. Below the cargo deck, this is the well deck. This is the part that's just a short distance, maybe six, seven feet above the sea when they're fueling another uh, ship. This is the uh, aircraft carrier uh, Sergeant Bay on the left-hand side of your screen. The yellow arrow points to the place where my father, John Mayer, was sleeping the morning they got hit by the Type 1 Kai-10. He was sleeping on a cot right here on the well deck. He woke up when the ship was rocked by a violent explosion. He was thrown up into the air. He woke up and he slammed it into the steel deck approximately 12 feet from where his cot was. And he looked up towards the bow and everything in front of the bridge area was a huge orange and red fireball. First thing that ran through my dad's mind was some dummy's been smoking over the aviation gasoline tanks up forward again. That wasn't the case. They had been attacked. Pretty soon, within seconds, hot droplets of oil that were on fire started raining down on Mississinawa and every vessel that was close by. And so my father, of course, like many of the sailors, was only wearing skibbies essentially underwear uh, because it was so hot in the Pacific at night. And so he began to get burned by the raining droplets of burning oil and ducked under the cargo deck, got into the cruise quarters, had enough time to get on a pair of trousers and a pair of shoes, 
by that time there was absolute panic the ship was blowing up ammunition magazines and the fire spread so fast that sailors were running through the crew compartment yelling abandon ship my father handed towards the stern and went over the side however it was a horrific situation because the ship within a very short time in a matter of just a few minutes was surrounded completely by flaming oil and gasoline floating on top of the water you'd been taught in basic training when you abandon ship you grab your life jacket and you go over with your life jacket on the men that went over the rail with the life jacket on were pretty soon engulfed by the flames or asphyxiated because the oxygen was burned up at the surface of the water uh, the men that dove without a life jacket they were able to go underneath the water splash away the burning oil and flames take a deep breath of oily sooty dirty air swim underneath the flaming oil until they could reach open water and there was only about 45 50 feet of open water just off the the stern of the vessel a really dangerous situation that resulted in quite a loss of life at Ulithia Atoll, this picture was taken shortly after, after Mississippi was hit. And this photograph appeared in every newspaper on the front page in the United States, Christmas week, 1944. Some of you out there that are watching this program may recognize the name Joseph Rosenthal. He was a famous photographer that took the photograph of the flag racing on Iwo Jima in 1945. He took this photograph that the Associated Press released to newspapers across the U.S. Sid Harris was a man that lived in New Jersey. He has sadly passed away now. He took 37 photographs from his fleet tug, USS Muncie, of the firefighting aboard Mississinawa and the effort to try and save the ship. I had put ads in VFW and American Legion magazines with helps of local residents here in Platteville veterans. And I received a call from Mr. Harris one day. He said, uh, Mike, I have something you might like to see. He had the original negatives and also photograph prints of the sinking of Mississinawa as it happened. And uh, those negatives were sent to Platteville. They resided in my lockbox at Mount City Bank until three years ago when they were donated to the U.S. Naval Archives. On the right here, you can see that within a matter of uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, most of the paint had burned off of the hull. The fires were so hot, the 5-inch 38 magazine had blown up with a tremendous roar. The man on the left is Sub-Lieutenant Sekio Nishina. Now in the Japanese language, the letter I is pronounced like a long E in English. So the correct pronunciation is Nishina. This is a man that sank the Mississinawa. He was a co-inventor of the Kaiten weapon, and he also carried the ashes of his friend Hiroshi Kuriki, who had died in that very first training accident just uh, a scant three months before. And he was the one that slammed into the side of Mississinawa. I did, with Mr. Yamada, managed to figure out his attack track and how he got in. I interviewed uh, sailors on the bridges of several ships that spotted his Stubby's periscope come up. And he moved towards Mississinawa, sitting very low in the water, fully loaded, ready to go to sea. And the results of the ton and a half of explosive on the starboard side, just ahead of the bridge, was absolutely catastrophic. Mississippi was hit at 5.45 a.m. in the morning. Most of the men were sleeping. Sadly, 63 sailors died 
And out of a crew of 278 officers and men, all but 40 men were burned or injured, hurt in some way. My dad was one of the lucky 40 that was not hurt at all. And so he was very, very fortunate, but the incident was so traumatic that it was something he just simply could not talk about until 1995. This is the scuba dives at uh, Ulithi Atoll on the wreck. I did have an opportunity to make six scuba dives on the wreck in 2013. Ulithi is out in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific, and so it was very difficult to get there. And the, there we are, swimming down towards the sand on the bottom of the ocean. This fellow right here is myself. I am uh, scuba diving right by the screws of the Mississippi that are 16 feet in diameter, two of them. Absolutely huge. And the rudder itself, too, was also quite large. I made six scuba dives on the wreck of the ship along with a 73-year-old man whose father was entombed on the ship. Uh, quite an emotional experience for both of us. Sadly, the cost of war is a telegram that families across the United States would get that looked exactly like this. Lieutenant Robert Rowe, the navigator aboard Mississinawa, who died on a hospital ship at Ulithi Atoll. Two weeks before Mississippi was hit, Lieutenant Robert Rowe sent a letter home to his wife and his little daughter, Janet, Janice. Jan Tracy was seven years old at the time. At the very end of each letter that Lieutenant Rowe would send home to his wife, he'd have a little section for Jan. And in his final letter, he said, Jan, all the daddies aboard ship miss their little girls, and I promise you I'm going to come home soon. I did some research work with Jan Tracy and discovered that the day that she and her mother received this letter was the exact same day across the international date line that Lieutenant Robert Rowe died from horrible third degree burns aboard a hospital ship at Ulithi. Robert Rowe was only 33 years old. He was the sailor, the officer that the young boys, the deckhands, really looked up to. Normally, officers don't associate very much with enlisted sailors, but Robert Rowe was the father figure that these men, when I interviewed them in their 70s, their 80s, and even their 90s, said, he was the officer that always come down to the deck to make sure that we were okay. We were kids, we were 17, 18, 19 years old, a long ways away from home. And he, he really cared about us. He will always be remembered for that. One of the officers that uh, was a sad and tragic loss, as they all were, of course. loss of the USS Mississinawa as a result of enemy action in the Central Pacific was announced by the Navy today. The vessel, a 23,000-ton auxiliary oiler, carried a normal complement of approximately 250 officers and men, of whom the Navy said about 80% were saved. Captain Philip G. Beck of Brooklyn, New York, skipper of the vessel, credited an unidentified pilot of a little Navy float plane with saving many men. According to Beck, the pilot of that plane had more nerve than he could think of. He saw their plight and put his plane down on the water. Then he would taxi up to the rim of the flames, throw out a thin line with a floater attached to it for those struggling men to grab a hold on to, then tow them to safety. He kept on going back until he had rescued at least 20 men who otherwise probably would have burned to death. He said he wished he could find out who that pilot was. He just disappeared after his rescue work was done. Nearly 60 years later, I figured out who that pilot was and contacted uh, 
his son. So we did finally find him and his family. Uh, his name was Blaze Zamuson, one of the youngest pilots in the U.S. Navy, just like uh, former President George Bush, Bush was a very young pilot at the time. In 2017, the Japanese in Japan with a group called Kaiten Kenshokai. These are family members of Kaiten pilots, some of them siblings, most of them uh, adult children and relatives, decided that the book Kaiten offered a very fair and balanced account of what had happened on both sides. And they published uh, the book that Joy Walter and I wrote in Japanese. And the Japanese were astounded. They knew nothing about the American side and what had happened. And this book is still being sold in Japan today. For me, closure had not come. In 2019, I asked permission from Kaiten Kanshukai for Nancy, my wife, and I to travel to Japan. I wanted to attend the Kaiten Memorial Ceremony held on the site of their secret training base in Tokiyama Bay, and as you see, the small little Kaiten Museum. I asked for permission to come and watch this ceremony. I didn't speak Japanese, but closure had eluded me, and I really needed to go. I wanted to talk to Japanese families, so I understood the full scope of the, this entirely human story from all cultures' perspectives. These are pictures from the memorial ceremony. You see up here on the upper left, myself, my wife, Nancy. Uh, this gentleman is a very, very famous actor in Japan that actually appeared in a movie about Kaiten 16 years ago. Our first stop was Hiroshima. I've worked with Tomoko, my translator, since 1997. Uh, she has been absolutely wonderful. If it wasn't for her, she translated much of my early writings so the Kaiten pilots could see what I was writing, and they determined that I was an honorable man and honest in the writing, and that's why she convinced them to work with me. Tomoko took us to the Peace Memorial. This is the building that looks exactly as it looked after it was ruined by the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima in August of 1945. Tomoko works with the film directors that come to Hiroshima to film about the atomic bomb. She took us to Peace Memorial Park. This is the park that is dedicated to the memory of the victims of the atomic bomb it's visited by tens of thousands of visitors from all over the world every year. Uh, at that park, we managed to, I we took this little boom here and I rang the peace bell at the park with Nancy looking on. The mound that you see here on this left-hand side of the photo was one of the most sobering experiences I have ever had. Contained within this mound, are the ashes of 30,000 people that could not be identified after the bomb was dropped. I stood in front of there just so overwhelmed, very difficult to even begin to comprehend that. This is Tomoko right here and myself um, with a reporter from a Sasi uh, newspaper, the oldest daily newspaper in Japan. This was my first of 14 newspaper interviews that we did in, J in Japan. The visit there was historic, and I'll explain why. We were in the southern portion of Japan. This is the Inland Sea. This is Hiroshima, and we were right here. Um, the large city of Shunan is a city of 300,000 people. I had an audience with the mayor of Shunan. Um, her name is uh, Mrs. Risuko, and we stayed at a little tiny town, about 75,000 people, about the same size as Dubuque. And the island, the secret training base, is out here in Tokiyama Bay. This is a view from our hotel window, and this is actually Ashizima Island, where 
was the site of the secret training base and now the Kaiten Memorial Museum. And this is the train station. You get to get around Japan by the high speed bullet trains that take you everywhere and they take you there very, very quickly. Our hosts in uh, Japan um, had become very close friends, very, very close friends. And for my good buddy, Nick, uh, from St. Lucia in the Caribbean Islands, uh, Nick, I know you're watching today. This is our friend uh, Fum Fumahito Hirosan. Hirosan, san means mister. It also is a title. Nancy was known as Nancy-san, and I was known as Mike-san. This is Mr. Harada, the president of Kaijin Ken Shokai. And this was one of the translators, his friend, Ted. And he had the nickname Ted because he went to school at UCLA in California. And his friends could not pronounce his name. So they said, we're going to call you Ted. And so that became his nickname. Um, so these were our hosts, along with uh, several other members of Kaijin Ken Shokai that helped us throughout the, the many days that we were in Tokuyama for our visit. This is a picture of Nancy and myself uh, standing in front of a replica of a Type 1 Kai-10. This is the hatch area in a little stubby periscope. The diameter of this weapon is only three feet wide. And fuel was so short in Japan at the end of the war that they would cram two Japanese sailors inside this weapon to train in Tokuyama Bay. The If you're claustrophobic, you don't want to be in a Kai-10. And they would actually have two men training in one of these weapons because fuel was so short in such short supply. I was really overcome with the emotion just even seeing this weapon, this replica of this weapon. And this was outside of a uh, another small museum on a training base. Inside this tiny museum, I was walking by this glass display case and noticed this brown flight suit, uh, like flight suit. It was a uniform worn by the Kai-10 pilots during a mission. I stopped and paused because the American sailor that pulled the body of Sikyo Nishina out of the waters of Yulithi Atoll described this clothing here, and it looked exactly the way that Marshall Doak, this American sailor, described the clothes. The museum curator took it out of the case for me so I could see it and have a close look. And this is uh, my dear friend uh, Hiro-san, uh, also a good buddy of my friend Nick, who's watching today. And we're holding up that uniform so that uh, Nancy could take a picture. Once we reached Asajima Island, this is the tiny museum in the background. These stones are along a walkway to the front door of the museum. Each marker represents the loss of a Kai-10 pilot during the Pacific War. 35 lost in training, I think almost 35 lost in training, and approximately 100 that were lost on Kai-10 missions. The museum personnel had put flowers in front of Seikyo Nishina's memory stone is memorial stone he was the sailor that sank my father's ship mississinawa we had film crews with us from morning until evening this was a historic event having us visit japan the first americans to visit japan and this particular island since world war ii the first representatives from the mississinawa mississinawa families Inside the museum, I got to know this man. Yusaku sat next to me during the memorial ceremony. His brother, Taro, at age 21, died on a Kaiten mission near Yap. He was sent to attack Ulithi Atoll, the same place where my father's ship was at, but discovered by American forces in the submarine, the mother submarine that he was aboard was chased towards Yap going south where it was eventually sunk. I'm listening to a recording of his voice, the only known recording ever made of a Kai-10 pilot before leaving on a mission. During this recording, he told his family not to worry. 
He was doing his duty. And this is his will that he wrote out before he left on his mission. We then walked down the mountainside and went out to this pier in Tokiyama Bay. This pier is where the Kai-10 were launched for training in Tokiyama Bay. As I mentioned, we had film crews with us every day from morning until evening recording what we were doing uh, from both national television networks as well as uh, local television affiliates. And so we're walking out on the walkway there to reach uh, out here to the launch area where they used to launch the Kai-10 into the bay for training. I never thought I would actually get to see this. It was big news in Japan that Mike and Nancy Mayer visited uh, because I was the first person to speak at the memorial ceremony that was a foreigner in Japanese history, a sacred ceremony that even Prime Minister Abe uh, went to every two or three years. It was a historic event, was covered by all the major Japanese newspapers. Our picture was on the front pages of the three national newspapers. It was reconciliation, according to the Japanese. This is a group known as the bereaved families. Each one of these people here had lost an immediate family member on a Kaiten mission. I had the chance to go with Tomoko, my translator, and listen to the personal stories of 20 of these families. That is what finally gave me closure after you know, nearly 25 years of working on this story because I understood the suffering that their families went through as well as understanding the suffering that the American families went through. And that finally gave me inner peace that I had not known before this. Well, oh, Mike, that was uh, such a profound story. I, it's the uh, what you accomplished was really remarkable with researching the story of your father and and really following that story all the way back to Japan um, through this uh, period of uh, period of um, what what's the word that you said. Uh, the Japanese viewed it as reconciliation. It was the opportunity for, as a representative of, Amer of Mississippi families, and they also told me as a representative of the USA to actually be in Japan. And uh, that was very, very important for not only for me, but for them as well, to have this uh, this reconciliation. Well, some people have already started typing in some questions. Um, and so uh, if you have a question for Mike, this is a great time for you to go ahead and use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'd just like uh, to share that uh, Mike has been uh, generous enough uh, to, to contribute signed copies of his book so that uh, everyone who has signed up for tonight's talk is uh, invited to pick up a complimentary copy either here at the museum or at the library, or at Platteville City Hall. So again, uh, by having registered, you you may come and pick up your own complimentary copy of Mike's book. Um, okay, Mike, uh, we got a, a, a question here from N. DeVoe. The Kaiten carried 3,400 pounds of explosives. How did that compare with what a typical kamikaze plane could carry? Actually, uh, Nick, uh, thank you for your question. That's really a very good question. Uh, Nick is probably would win our long distance award for a viewer. And uh, Nick, typically the Kamikaze uh, aircraft would carry uh, like a 500 pound bomb or a, a bomb of some sort that was externally, you know, on the wings of the aircraft. And so they did, did not actually put explosives in a Kamikaze aircraft. They would actually carry a conventional bomb when they actually would crash into a ship. And so something like a 500 pound bomb would be about the, the maximum that most of the type of aircraft that were used could carry. So uh, a ton and a half of explosive or 3,418 pounds was a substantially more uh, than what uh, a kamikaze aircraft could carry. 
And uh, where is Nick tuning in from? Nick is tuning in from uh, St. Lucia, uh, part of the U.S. Virgin Islands in the, in the, in the Caribbean. And so uh, I'd like to just plug uh, Nick's project. Nick's father was an RAF pilot and flew uh, submarine Spitfires during World War II. Nick has been sending his father's pilot's logbook all around the globe for the last several years and collecting signatures of World War II veterans and also collecting their stories in the hopes of writing a book. And so I've helped Nick a little bit connect with uh, people in Japan that he had wanted to reach. And so we've been working together for quite a while now. Wow. Great. Thanks for tuning in, Nick. You've definitely won uh, the furthest ever attendee award. <laughs> um, Patrick Daniels asks, uh, how long could a pilot be in a Kaiten? If they had to surface the mother sub to get in the Kaiten, it seemed like it could be quite a while before they were in place for a strike. That's actually a very, very good question, Patrick. Thanks for asking that one. They were often sealed in their Kaiten on the deck of the mother submarine for up to a couple hours before they were launched. And once they were launched, of course, there was no return. You continued on until either the fuel ran out in your Kaiten or you found a target. Um, the pilots also had the ability to uh, perform an act that the Japanese referred to as self determination. Essentially what that meant was you could actually arm the warhead and blow yourself up. Uh, this happened at Ulithi Atoll. Uh, two Kaiten were stranded on a reef in the south uh, east section of the lagoon and the interior of a Kaiten stranded on a shallow reef in those uh, equatorial waters would heat up very very quickly plus there was no source of oxygen other than the air inside the Kaiten. So they would slowly suffocate to death and also the heat as well. And so in the case of uh, two of the Kaiten that stranded on a reef in the wrong place in the darkness during the first hour of the attack, uh, those pilots blew up their Kaiten. Mm. Teresa, Ask a question. Uh, her her father, Larry Evanrude, is especially excited to watch your presentation. And for various reasons, some people may like to refer back to a recording of tonight's video uh, following the conclusion of the live talk. And I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that uh, after the completion of the talk, uh, everyone will receive an email with in, uh, with a link uh, later in the week, pro approximately Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. Um, with a link to the recording of Mike's talk. So you'll be able to uh, refer back to it later. Um, also, uh, there will be a reminder in that email about uh, how to pick up your own complimentary copy of the book Kaiten here at the museum, at the library, or at Platteville City Hall. No, thank you for that question, Teresa. Um, Patrick also asks, uh, why did so many die during training? The uh, Kai-10 was very, very difficult to maneuver. Um, matter of fact, uh, the Kai-10 pilots that I worked with said, you felt like you needed to have six hands in order to operate. There were so many valves and controls because you had to maintain ballast. The operator had to try and keep the man torpedo 15 feet below the surface of the water. This meant as fuel was used up, they had to bring in seawater to maintain level trim and it was very easy to broach the surface um, if you didn't have control in which case you would be spotted by uh, american forces and so it was very very difficult to operate and matter of fact very often uh, you could even hit something in training that was submerged in tokiyama bay so bandaged heads uh during their training was a pretty common sight that you would see Nancy Daniel says, Mike, thank you for an enlightening talk. Uh, Patrick, sa Patrick says, um, asks, could you describe uh, in a nutshell how the Kaiten got through the submarine net at the atoll? Yes, actually, the, they did not get through the submarine net at the atoll. They actually uh, sent one Kaiten, 
right to the entrance of Mulgrad Channel. That's where you saw that submarine net. And that particular Kite 10 pilot was supposed to be a diversion to, to divert attention away from the other mm. locations where they were trying to slip into the lagoon in between islands with uh, breaks uh, in the reef. And so that particular Kite 10 that was spotted at the mouth of Mulgrad Channel was spotted by U.S. Navy ships leaving and was actually rammed. And that started the whole story by the U.S. Navy that they had spotted midget submarines like the type that attacked Pearl Harbor. They were not. They were a new secret weapon that the U.S. Navy did not know about. Um, so the actual attack track of the other Kite 10 that got in was actually through other areas that was not the center main channel, the main place of ship tra traffic. Wow. Okay, Pat Wirtz asks, uh, how was the Navy submariner supposed to survive after the bomb had been launched? The submariner would not survive after the uh, bomb exploded. Um, you, you could not survive that particular explosion. And so that was part of the problem with this particular program because when it was first proposed in early 1943, to the Japanese Imperial uh, senior staff, uh, they insisted that it could not be a suicide or what the Japanese referred to as a toko weapon. And so they insisted that an escape hatch be placed on the underneath the Kaiten pilot so that they could escape out of the Kaiten 75 yards, 100 yards before it actually struck a ship. Well, that's not a practical consideration at all. The fact was officially ignored that it was done to placate some of the senior staff officers. Instead, that bottom hatch was utilized um, on missions to create a canvas tube they would attach with a telephone line. And so the uh, Kai-10 built after the first few types, you could crawl into it through this canvas tube from inside the submarine without surfacing and being spotted. Hmm. Nick uh, put a little follow-up just saying uh, that you've helped him a ton and uh, clarifies his location in St. Lucia. He says, uh, St. Lucia, it's an independent, independent island, a former British colony. Let's see. Uh, Tom says, uh, Tom Doak says, great job, Mike. Have you planned another trip to Japan? That's actually a good question. If I can just follow up a little bit with Nick. Nick, I'm sorry I mispronounced the name of uh, your island. My Actually, my, I do better with Japanese pronunciations than I do. And uh, so maybe I need a geography uh, lesson, uh, Nick. So thank you for your comment. Um, and as far as another trip, <coughs> currently I'm working with the Japanese right now. When I was in Japan, the mission of Kaiten Kenshikai is to educate younger generations at the museum. I have encouraged them to include an exhibit that includes the American experience with the Kai-10 to give the opportunity for visitors at the museum to be able to understand from cultural viewpoints, the American and from the Japanese side. The other thing that is happening is that the Japanese are applying for a grant from the Paul Allen Foundation to do a major documentary film on Kai-10. Um, I would, did not know this, but I was interviewed in Japan and they did some video of me as they are proposing to ask for this grant money. I did not know that Paul Allen, who has found many sunken warships in the Pacific um, with his research vessel Petrel and a team of scientists at his foundation, he was interested in Kai-10, but sadly he passed away from cancer before he realized that goal. So. He did put in his will that he wanted funding to be provided for a major documentary film. Um, I will be assisting with that project and that actually has just gotten started just within the last couple, three weeks. Uh, I don't know if I'll be going back to Japan, but I would not be surprised if that did happen. Fabulous. Uh, Sarah Lomas Flesh asks, uh, well, she says, thank you so much for all that you shared. And how much was your father eventually involved in your research? And would you be willing to tell us a little bit more about his post-war life? 
Sure. Um, he actually was not involved much with the research other than the fact that my first two years I spent trying to figure out where the ship had gone in the Pacific and to help jog his memory so I understood what his job was, what he was doing, where he had gone. And for veterans from this time period, the memory comes back in fragments. It truly does. It's not like you remember everything that happened. Something will trigger your memory um, so that you recall an event or something that occurred. Um, so when my father came back as a survivor, and this was in December, he arrived uh, home in Janesville, Wisconsin on a train uh, close to midnight on Christmas Eve on 1944. And uh, he had been in the Pacific where it was, you know, well over 100 degrees every single day and came back to 30 degrees below zero uh, in here in Wisconsin. And uh, he then served out the rest of his uh, time in the Navy during World War II until May 1946 in San Diego and became a, a skilled uh, machinist in and learned that particular trade. He took those skills and became a toolmaker for Parker Pen Company in Janesville, where he worked for his entire career. Um, however, the Korean War broke out. Uh, on June 25th, 1950, and uh, my dad got a letter from uh, Uncle Sam uh, in early September going, uh, uh, Dear John, we need you again in your uh, sailor's uniform. And so he went back into the Navy. And at that particular time, they were taking active duty Navy sailors. They were going to the Korean Peninsula area with combat vessels, support vessels, Reservists like my dad ended up, he ended up in the Mediterranean aboard a destroyer tender uh, and served uh, over there for uh, nearly 11 months before he came home back home. Matter of fact, my parents had to change their wedding date. Uh, Mom said they printed up all the wedding invitations, had to tear them all up and have them reprinted because it was like, let hurry up, let's get married. And uh, for, she got a little apartment in Norfolk and dad shipped out. That's the way it was during those times. Uh, my dad retired from Parker Penn in 1989 and uh, lived on a house on a lake in central Wisconsin. And he uh, passed away here, uh, actually, in uh, Platteville in 2005. Well, I must be so proud of your work. Uh, Tom Young says that your tenacious research is so valuable and very much appreciated. And uh, sends thanks from uh, he and Kay Young. Thank, thanks, Tom and Kay. I, I appreciate your, your support. You've listened to me talk about this quite a bit over the years. Isn't that wonderful? Dave Allen also says, thank you, Mike, and great job. He asked, do you have any idea how many U.S. ships were attacked or sunk by Titans during the war? Yes, two. Oh. Uh, the Mississippi was the only documented sinking. What they what they refer to as a documented sinking was the Titan was responsible for the actual sinking of the ship. A second ship, uh, USS Underhill, was going across Lady Gulf in July of 1945 and was attacked by a Kaiten. Um, that Kaiten was launched by my friend, Lieutenant Minoru Yamada, that was aboard I-53, the Navigator. He actually launched that Kaiten. The Kaiten was piloted by Jun Katsuyama whose nephew became a very, very close friend of mine and worked on the Kaiten book with me and uh, lived in Japan, uh, sadly passed away from cancer at a much too young age. But so the underhill was hit, the entire bow was blown off, the stern of the ship continued to float, U.S. forces then scuttled the ship. And so those are the only two ships that were successfully sunk by uh, Kaiten. However, the Japanese lost over 2,000 sailors in this program, both on the mother submarines and the Kaiten pilots. So they had tremendous loss of life for very little gain as anti-submarine forces by the Americans stepped up the pace after the attack on Ulithi that sank Mississinawa, then the Japanese were forced to launch Kaiten in the open sea. Remember, this was difficult to handle, and being launched in the open sea, the chances of hitting a target were quite remote. Um, and so for many of those Kaiten, they simply sank to the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I've got a couple of questions for you as, as well, Mike. Um, yeah, I was interested in your discussion about the Kaiten Museum in Japan. Yes. And what uh, role did you find that museum played in preserving and interpreting the story of the Kaiten pilot and program, as well as the attack victims? And did the, the museum uh, color your view about what you think about museums or what makes a good museum? That's actually a very good question. I appreciate the question, Eric, because of the fact that when I did tour through the museum, much of the content of that museum is dedicated to the Kikasui, this inaugural mission with Sekio Nishina that sank Mississinawa. That was their most successful mission, this inaugural mission. So much of the museum is dedicated to that. But of course, it is also dedicated to the Kaiten pilots that were launched on, on a mission, never came home. Families did donate uh, artifacts to the museum to be able to tell that particular story in that regard. Uh, the museum cur curator um, was absolutely uh, wonderful to work with, but I continued to bring up when I was in Japan that um, the idea that the museum is dedicated to the Kaiten and the Japanese Kaiten pilots. I've always felt, and I wrote the book Kaiten and did my research to tell the whole story from a multicultural standpoint, including the Ulithi natives. And I felt it was really important that that entire story be shared. And so I really <laughs> encouraged them a great deal, probably bugged them maybe a bit much, and continue to encourage them to consider that. Uh, should they share the entire story? Should they tell about the American side? They finally agreed that that would be a very good idea. So I'm looking forward to working with them here in the future to try and accomplish that goal to tell the entire story, to be more educational, more informative. The museum is a very small museum. It's primarily supported by uh, donations, although it is administered by the city of Shunan. And so the current curator of the museum is actually part of the municipal staff of the city, just of course, like our staff here, uh, such as yourself with the city. And so now they have digitized their archives which is wonderful. Um, those archives are not online and they're not available in any language other than Japanese at this particular point in time. Perhaps that will change in the future. I certainly hope so because I think that for researchers like myself that information would be very helpful and I, I also feel expand the role of, the, of their museum as well. Well, you're certainly covering a lot of the same types of uh, issues that relate to our museum too, uh, matters of funding, management, and digitizing collections and making yes. those collections accessible uh, to a wider audience. So yeah, you're really speaking our language here. You know, another thing that I was struck by is in your tenacity to tell uh, research and tell the story that uh, you actually dived uh, to the site <clears throat> even had to help uh, locate the uh, ship. And yes, so sir. could you tell a little bit about um, learning to dive and your experience as a diver? Sure. Um, I didn't know if I would ever have a chance to even visit there because it is so remote. The only way you can get to Ulithi Atoll is on a medical evacuation airplane. And that particular aircraft makes a trip from Yap, which is about 260 miles round trip in the air, uh, about once a week to Ulithi. They bring out people that may be sick, need medical care, um, or for some other reason, uh, maybe a family member that lives elsewhere in Micronesia is sick or something like that, they want to visit them. And so that is the only way to actually get to the island. However, they don't have a dive shop. They don't have diving equipment either. I learned to dive in Maui in 2008 i got my basic certification at that point in time the dive shop was owned by a former navy seal who happened to be involved with the dives uh, from howard hughes glomar explorer on the wreck of the russian sub k129 and uh, so i learned my basic skills there and then on a second trip to maui i received an advanced diving certification this allowed me to be able to go to the maximum depth, depth of 140 feet for air, 
which was needed because the Mississippi was bow rests at 137 feet deep in the ocean. And I did that just in case I ever had the opportunity. In 2013, Chip Lambert contacted me, said he had been at a dive show, met John Chatterton, who we just saw in that History Channel clip, and uh, asked John Chatterton if there's any way to get to Ulithi and be able to dive on the ship years after Chip took an expedition there to find it. And John Chatterton made arrangements with an American in, in the app. They took our dive gear. They went across 130 miles of open ocean in a small 35-foot boat, strapped around the perimeter with uh, diesel 55-gallon drums of fuel because there was no fuel on the island to get to get back home. They took our dive gear. We flew in on this little tiny twin prop beach airplane, and we landed on the World War II airstrip that up until 9-11 was crushed coral, just like it was in World War II. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Uh, paved it with concrete as an emergency landing strip after 9-11 in case it was needed. But it, it, is, it is short. We landed there, and I'll tell you, you hear about young students talking about the instructor using the chicken break. I wish I would have had one because you get the inner runway, all you see is ocean. <laughs> wow. yeah. And so uh, it was quite a flight in and a flight out. On the very first day, we were only there for an hour, hour and a half before we were on a dive boat heading out to the Mississippi. Took a little while to find the wreck. It had been quite a few years since uh, the wreck had been uh, seen. And our group that dove on that wreck, the uh, husband and wife team that were two of the people that found the wreck in 2001, I said a 73-year-old man uh, uh, was with me that his father's entombed on the wreck. And uh, we made the, the dives out there, and we were the last group to actually dive on the wreck. So there's only been a tiny handful of people have ever seen it. Mike, I think we have time for uh, one more question. And uh, Dave Meinhart says, uh, great job, Mike. And could you please... Uh, talk a bit about the native people and their role. And uh, I saw, I'm assuming he's talking about the Ulithi Atoll people. Yes. Yeah, the Ulithians are, were absolutely wonderful, Dave. And they actually welcomed us with, uh, with open arms. I had been communicating, writing letters to uh, two of the local tribal chiefs for 20 years. And so when we finally did get the chance to go out there, one of the things that Chip Lambert was ran to a stumbling block was you had to have permission from the tribal chiefs to even go to their islands. You can't just go there, you know, you can't just be a tourist and go there. And so I did help secure a permission to do that. And they were absolutely wonderful. Um, matter of fact, the Lithians asked me to stay behind after the rest of the dive team went back to Yap. And I took that opportunity to really immerse myself into the local culture and learn about their culture. Um, I had a chance to speak with uh, our our host, uh, whose mother actually was an eyewitness, uh, you know, to all of this when she was six years old, and she told me about it. Told about the Japanese occupation of their islands, as well. Um, the people there were just absolutely amazing, uh, friendly, and uh, I would love to go back there again. Wow. Well, you've certainly inspired, I think, a lot of us to be very curious about part of the world, that story, and to think more about some of our relatives who served in the Pacific uh, in World War II. And since then, uh, couldn't be more grateful. Um, you had uh, one more viewer just say amazing story and information. And thank you so much for taking the time to share this full story. Well, I would like to thank all of our viewers uh, today for taking time out of your day and to allow me to share uh, the story of my father's ship and his uh, shipmates and also uh, the Japanese and to give you a little bit of a perspective of what it was like from both sides during an incident that uh, was really not known for a very long time. And I appreciate uh, this is a real honor for me and I, I'm very grateful. Once again, uh, all of you are uh 
entitled to a complimentary copy of a signed uh, copy of uh, Kai 10, and you can pick that up right here at the museum at the Platteville Public Library or at Platteville City Hall. Um, and I certainly hope that uh, you, Mike, will consider, and all of you uh, who are watching today will tune in next Sunday for the final of the Winter Lyceum Lectures, in which a panel will present 45 years of underground adventure, the mining museum's Bevins Mine. And this is uh, going to be about how not long had the Platteville Mining Museum been in existence before staff and leadership began making plans to rediscover the 1845 Bevins Mine in the museum's backyard and to open it safely to the public using the latest in mine safety technology and Platteville trained talent. So do please, again, tune in uh, next week. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and good night. At Taco John's, we're blowing up your phone with great deals. The only problem is how many there are. Crunching, 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 crunching. Sorry, not sorry. Taco John's. Bigger, bolder, better.